Oh, Lacey here. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to the puppy wrestling match you see before you. That is Bruno and Shayla having a little playtime, which is great, and I'm not going to stop them. So you get to enjoy it too. Probably for the second time this month, because I'm filming a batch of videos, and they've been playing for half of it. <laughs> I think Shayla, the black one, lets Bruno, the brown one, win all the time. Are you going to get her? This is your entertainment today. You're welcome. Oh, go get him. Go get him. Go get him. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can make a video real quick before they come back. Okay. So, welcome back to 31 Days of Tarot. Today is day 24. What cards in the deck are most misunder mis misunderstood? Misunderstood. Misunderstood. And why? I just said misunderstood three times. Also, you're welcome. I will have the link for Anthony's video down below, you know the drill. I'm also pre-recording these in a batch, so if I seem a little bit all over the place, it is because I have a growing pile of tarot decks and other tarot accoutrement next to me, and I have been knocking these videos out, and I'm wearing the same outfit, and I'm ready, I'm ready almost, for a cup of tea and some bedtime. But first, let's talk about some crazy difficult cards, and how I think they have and can be easily misinterpreted. Ten of Swords. Looks real dramatic. <laughs> And that is actually what I have to say about the Ten of Cor Ten of Swords. When I read this card in a more traditional way, where it's like betrayal and endings and drama, it's drama that sticks out to me. So the Ten of Swords can also just simply mean the culmination of a project or an idea, something that's more associated with thought processes. Maybe you've just learned a really hard lesson about your own way of communicating with people and expressing yourself. Maybe. You have experienced some sort of an ending, a new paradigm you're moving into, but it doesn't feel so great to be in that situation. And I think that the Ten of Swords illustrates the drama we can feel when that is going on. But I also think that it can just speak to the way we get worked up in our own heads, the way that we spiral. And I know the Nine of Swords speaks to that with anxiety and such as well. But with the Ten of Swords, I see it as that over the top energy a bit of things are like over the top like he's not just stabbed with one sword he's stabbed with ten swords and i think that i got this perspective first from um i want to say from melissa sonova's sonova's book kitchen table tarot i think is where i first saw this over the topness description and it just really resonated i was like yes it is so dramatic who stabs somebody with ten swords and leaves them all sitting there like not okay <laughs> but so ever since then i tend to take ten of swords as a Yes, there may have been an ending, there may be something that's come to a close, but it doesn't necessarily have to be as dramatic as you're allowing it to feel. And that's one way that I think that the Ten of Swords can be misunderstood. Sometimes I see this card being read straight up as betrayal and backstabbing, and while I think that can be a part of this card, sometimes I think this card is more about how you feel than what is. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of the Swords cards, actually, because they're a lot about what's happening in our heads, where we're feeling mentally overwhelmed, where we're feeling um, mentally confronted and I just think that the Ten of Swords we sometimes miss that nuance with the with the confrontingness of the image so I just that's just something that I I feel about this card but I'm curious what you think about the Ten of Swords and how we you know how this sort of if that makes sense to you you know what I mean am I just is that just all me I don't think so I think it's really over the top this image also kind of just annoys me a little bit because I think it's supposed to be bloody but it also kind of looks like just a blanket draped over him that's also red and pink stripes but then there's like blood over here I don't know it's a confusing image I don't know but I do think it's often misunderstood let's talk about death I mean I'll be surprised if other people don't talk about this one because there's the obvious point that when you pull this card for somebody who is new to tarot as a reader you want to immediately reassure them this is not talking about physical death but this card can talk about physical death and I think sometimes we're a little quick to dismiss it um, and I'm not saying that that's how it should be read. It's happened to me one time um, in 20 years of reading. I don't think that it's a common experience but I think all endings matter and are significant to a person's life and I think that sometimes this is speaking about literal death. I don't think that the tarot predicts people's death date. Um, I think that sometimes it pulls what people are worried about. I think sometimes it pulls deaths nearby. Um, let me back up. Do I think that it can say, do I think the death card can predict somebody's death? 
I need to rewind what I said because I do think yes. But I think more it's speaking to the querent or the seeker's experience of that. Um, the seeker's fears about that or how the seeker is handling that concept in their life with either themselves or somebody that they love. And again, when this card, again, once in 20 years, I don't think it's a common thing that this is going to refer to an actual death. And most of the time, sure, transformation is an okay word to use, but words I like better are endings that you can't avoid, um, the inevitability of endings, of something shifting that you're not ready to let go of, something dying that you're not ready to let go of, or an ending you're not ready for. I think those are all things that I sort of associate with this card. And I think sometimes we oversimplify it when we just talk about only transformation I don't think death is only an opportunity. I think there's a struggle here and I think it's an important part of the story and one that sometimes we gloss over a little bit. And you know, I think as a reader, when you're reading for somebody else, if you are an intuitive reader, you can kind of tell, I feel like what your querent is ready for or what you're ready for in a reading and you're gonna filter what you say and how you deliver that message carefully through what you think that person is ready for or what you're personally ready for. And I think that's a part of reading skillfully. I don't think that there's anything disingenuous about that. I think that giving somebody information they're not ready for can be irresponsible. And so I think to me, trusting your instincts on what is an appropriate message to deliver with this card is important. But I also think it's important that we remember that these arcana, the major arcana, were meant to be about the great mysteries of life, the great moments that we experience that lead us to our personal evolution and our personal growth and I think dealing with death and loss is a part of that so I do think it's important to remember that this is it's all part of it it's all part of it so sometimes I do think this card is misunderstood in that way hopefully that made some kind of sense clear as mud let me know down below I'm curious finally everybody's very favorite card ever the tower so I used to be, I used to have a really contentious relationship with the tower. I mean, I still do. It's the tower. It's not a fun card for me. I don't love change to begin with. And I especially don't like it when the rug is pulled out from under me, which is totally what the tower represents. That being said, I have now, as I'm a little older and have had a little more experiences, I feel like I have had more experiences that I could point to with the tower that were opportunity, that were good and healthy where sometimes you literally need to wipe the table all by yourself, wipe everything off of it and start fresh. And I think sometimes we do that consciously. And that can be a really powerful way to experience a tower moment where you're just like, you know what, enough. And you just start over. And so you can enact your own tower experience in a really empowered way. It doesn't always have to be the rug pulled out from under you. It's just that it's hard to go through. It's hard to start fresh. It's hard to feel like you're backsliding and starting over, those things are challenging. But I think sometimes we forget that there can be a beautiful level of empowerment in the tower and that sometimes when it's pulled, it is an opportunity. It's not only catastrophe. And I think especially when we read for ourselves, or at least when I read for myself, it's quick to see catastrophe and it's a little harder to get into those other layers and see opportunity or see the ways that you could step willingly into that experience and directed in a way that's going to be beneficial for you. So those are the three, the big three, I guess I would say, that are, I was going to pull them all up. Yes, there we go. Yeah, these would be the big three. These are these cards, by the way, that I'm showing today are from the Crystal Unicorn Tarot by Pamela Chen and Lisa Higuchi. That's what the box looks like, um, which I thought would just be a nice, softer way to talk about these three very difficult cards. Um, for more information on sort of what I think about at least these two, you can tune into my Tarot Memoirs series. I'll try to remember to link that down below because I believe, yes, at the time you're viewing this, I will have covered both of these cards and you can get deeper into sort of my feelings on them and what I've learned about them. So with that said, I'm going to leave it there. Don't forget to like this video down below if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you are new here and I will see you all again in my very next video. Take care. Bye-bye.